In 1823, German astronomer Heinrich Olbers looked up at the night sky and saw darkness. He wondered, if the universe were infinite and eternally static, surely the night sky should shine with the light of infinite stars, a dazzling, brilliant sky. Olbers' paradox was so compelling that many considered it proof of a finite universe, a cosmos that at some point simply ends. It wasn't until a century later, when Edwin Hubble observationally established the reality of an expanding universe that Olbers' paradox was firmly solved. Olbers' second assumption was wrong, the universe is not static. But what does modern astronomy have to say about the size of the universe though? Is it finite and if so does that mean there's an edge? Or could be infinite, an endless ocean of space with challenging philosophical consequences if so? How big is the universe? It's the sort of question that a child often asks when they first encounter the concept of space, and yet it is one which continues to perplex and haunt astronomers. It's often said that studying the cosmos is a humbling experience, for whilst early thinking considered the Earth, Sun and Moon to be the de facto universe, our modern understanding establishes one that it is unimaginably larger. At each stage in science's journey of revelation, humanity has had to swallow another great demotion quietly ushered down to an ever lower seat in the great cosmic hierarchy. These demotions began within the 16th century with Copernicus and Kepler challenging the geocentric view of their time and revealing that Earth is just another planet. Next, in 1838, Friedrich Bessel pioneered the parallax method to measure the distance to the star 61 Cygni, a staggering distance of more than 10 light years, or approximately 100 trillion kilometers. In 1920, Famed astronomers Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis debated at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History as to whether distant nebulae were small clouds on the outset of our galaxy, or entirely separate galaxies far further away. Soon after Edwin Hubble established that Curtis was right by proving that Andromeda was in fact far outside of the Milky Way galaxy, at a distance of 2.5 million light-years. Equipped with far superior telescopes, modern astronomy has pushed our observations to distances unimaginable even to these pioneering astronomers. For example, look at this image, it is one of the most incredible photos ever taken. You are looking at the most distant galaxy ever observed, GNZ 11. This galaxy is so far away that the light forming this image left it 13.4 billion years ago, a photographic time machine. The universe itself was just a few hundred million years old at this time, and so, GNZ 11 is a glimpse at what the first galaxies to ever form looked like. If we could see GNZ 11 as it is now, it would probably be unrecognizable and in fact likely have merged with other galaxies along the way. GNZ 11 is estimated to be 32 billion light years away from Earth. At first, this seems impossible if the light left 13.4 billion years ago, surely it's 13.4 billion light years away. But that's again falls into Olber's fallacy, the universe is not static. In fact, GNZ 11 has been hurtling away from us ever since the light from this image left, or more accurately, I should say space has been expanding, and so a correct calculation of its current distance needs to account for that fact. Objects like GNZ 11 can thus be thought of as establishing a minimum size of the universe. But given that it's 13.4 billion years old, and the universe is 13.8 billion years old, then surely it should be possible to image an object that's even older and thus further away and that would extend this minimum size yet more. It's at this point it's useful to talk about two distinct concepts, the visible universe and the observable universe. Neither of these really have anything to do with telescope capabilities but rather true limits dictated by spacetime. The observable universe would be the distance to an object that was present at the very dawn of the universe itself and whose light was now just reaching us. Of course the universe didn't have any stars or galaxies at the very beginning so there are no objects to detect. Nevertheless, based on the expansion rate of the universe, as measured using telescopes like ESA Planck mission, we estimate that this distance would be 45 billion light years away. If something was further away than this, there simply wouldn't have been enough time yet in the universe for its light to reach us. We often say such objects lie beyond our horizon like a ship that has dipped below the ocean's horizon, there's simply no way to see them whether they exist or not. In fact the horizon of the observable universe has a special name, the particle horizon. The visible universe is actually subtly different from this. For the first few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot it was an ionized plasma which essentially acted like a thick fog, 
Light couldn't traverse the universe without interacting with one of these ions. It's only when the universe cooled enough for atoms to form, clearing the fog away in an epoch known as reionization that light can freely travel. So the visible universe is a little bit smaller than the observable one by about a billion light years. This is a truly mind-bogglingly big number, no words or analogies really do justice to just how preposterously large the universe is. But it could be even bigger? Take the observable universe corresponding to a distance 45 billion light years away. Usually at this point video like this take that number and double it and call it the diameter of the observable universe. We have to be a little careful about that because what if we see another GNZ11 over in the opposite direction, not a galaxy similar to GNZ11 but the actual GNZ11. For example if the universe has a positive curvature like a sphere, then it's quite possible we would see the same galaxies and patterns in different directions. If that were true, Doubling this distance wouldn't correspond to the diameter but something more like the circumference of the universe. These repeating patterns seem to offer a possible way, then, for the universe to be smaller than we might naively have guessed. To answer this, let's return that moment of reionization in the early universe. This is the oldest light we can observe, and it comes from all directions. After all, the entire universe was filled with this ionized plasma. The light is known as the cosmic microwave background or CMB, and it encodes the temperature of the universe at this time. Any patch of the CMB more than 2 degrees away from another patch is too far away to have had time for light to travel between them, at least given the age of the universe at the time, just 380,000 years. So if we see a particular pattern or ripple repeated in the CMB but separated by several degrees or more, that could reveal the universe wraps around itself, implying a smaller universe. Detailed studies of the CMB reveal no such repeating structures though. The lack of such structure can be used to put lower limits on the size of the universe, but not surprisingly, these limits essentially correspond to the approximately size of the observable universe. So the full universe really does appear to be at least as large as the observable part. Now let's suppose someone lives in the galaxy GNZ11. They would be able to look back along that line of sight and see the proto-Milky Way as a faint distant galaxy too. But what if they looked in the opposite direction? Would they see an edge or some kind of physical boundary? Whilst we cannot truly know what they might see, a basic assumption in astronomy is the so-called cosmological principle which states that we do not live in a special part of the universe. So what we see is typical, and by extension what GNZ11 inhabitants see is likely not much different from us, at least on the largest of scales. Repeating patterns are not the only way to place limits on size though. Already I've mentioned the concept of curvature, and here perhaps we might finally have a clue unto its true size. Standing on the Earth, we can't directly see its curvature because the radius of curvature is just so vast, but the curvature can be detected with some geometry, as was famously done so by Eratosthenes of Cyrene two millennia ago by comparing the lengths of shadows of sticks in the midday sun at two different locations. In an analogous way, astronomers can use the CMB radiation and some geometry to measure the curvature of the universe itself. A simple way to think about this on a positively curved surface, like a sphere, two parallel lines will eventually meet. For example, if we both head straight north, no matter where you live, I will eventually bump into you at the North Pole. On a flat surface the lines stay true and parallel forever, but on a negatively curved surface, like a saddle, they diverge. So how curved is the universe? The curvature parameter, known as omega underscore k, has been refined ever more over the years thanks to missions studying the CMB. The earliest estimate, done by the Boomerang experiment in 2000, found it to be flat to within 6%. 18 years later, ESA's Planck mission published our current most precise estimate to date, which is again flat to within 0.19%. It is truly an amazing technical feat by legions of astronomers involved that we can measure the curvature of space at this level. But what does this really mean? Let's consider that the number is indeed exactly zero, a flat universe. It's at this point that many often look at that flatness and interpret it to mean the universe must be infinite. Look, it's perfectly reasonable to suggest the universe is infinite as a possible hypothesis, but it's not true it's the only explanation. It's a non sequitur that flatness requires infinite space. To cosmologists, flatness doesn't really mean what we might naively think in a flat universe can be finite. In fact, we've already discussed an example of such a universe. Let's go back to our friends Alice, Bob, and Carlos and imagine the universe really is two-dimensional, like a sheet of paper depicted here. If we had a warp drive, 
we could fly from Earth in the direction of Alice, and when we cross Carlos, we would re-emerge on the other side and be heading home again. This is probably familiar to any computer gamers, games like Pac-Man and Asteroids would often feature this rule. Since the, the left side and right side really correspond to the same line, the universe wraps around itself here. If up and down go on forever, then what we essentially have is an infinite cylinder. In fact, since I made this cylinder from a two-dimensional sheet, it's really a two-cylinder. The two-cylinder is really defined by left-goes-to-right Pac-Man rule operating on the original 2D sheet, what is known as the fundamental domain, that's what makes it a two-cylinder. When we roll it up in three dimensions, we're embedding the two-cylinder into three-dimensional space, but that's just us embedding it into 3D. So even though it looks curved when embedded in 3D, that's just a product of the embedding, it's actually still a flat geometry in its fundamental domain. Now this two-cylinder doesn't really save us from an infinite universe because its length extends out to infinity. So let's go back to our fundamental domain and look at our rules one more time. What if we add another rule that going past the upper edge takes you back to the lower edge? Now we truly have full Pac-Man rules. A fundamental domain described by these two rules is no longer an infinite two-cylinder but a finite two-torus. We call it a torus because if you imagine re-rolling it back up, we first get the cylinder as before, and then we have to connect these two ends together. In practice if I try to do this I'd have to stretch out the material distorting the plane, but we can see that it should form something like a donut-shaped torus. Now at this point it's useful to discuss John Nash, who you probably know from the biopic, A Beautiful Mind. The fact you have to stretch and distort the original plane to create the torus shape, means that you failed to isometrically embed it. And that isometric part is key, because without it distances are distorted in a way we don't see in the universe around us. But John Nash proved the it was in fact possible to isometrically embed a a two torus into three dimensions, by adding waves and waves of tiny corrugations during the embedding procedure. This was a beautiful proof, but it didn't actually reveal what this two torus embedded into 3D would actually look like. In 2012, a French team used supercomputers to finally calculate what the shape looked like. This stunning morphology is in fact flat in the fundamental domain, and adheres to the two-torus Pac-Man style rules. The French team went a step further and even uploaded a 3D print design up on their website. Thanks to those corrugations it's a formidable 3D print to actually pull off though. I asked around several New York printing agencies about this and they all basically just said straight up no. If there was anyone that could pull this off, it was going to be Joel, also known as the 3D Printing Nerd, an awesome YouTube channel that explores everything 3D print related. He took this on and has even created an awesome video describing this feat, please do check it out when you're done here. So here it is, a 3D embedded 2 torus, it's even more beautiful to hold and touch than the renderings. And what's truly mind-blowing is that I may actually be holding the universe in my hands, a finite flat cosmos embedded in some higher dimensional space. Of course remember that this is a two-torus, it's made from a two-dimensional plane. Since our universe has three spatial dimensions, the universe would need to be a three-torus, so a kind of hyper-dimensional extension of this incredible shape. The three-torus is in fact just one of ten different possible manifolds that could represent a flat, finite universe. Six of these are called orientable and include the three-torus. But four are so-called non-orientable manifolds and include this thing, the bizarre Klein bottle, a mind-bending shape off technically zero embedded volume. This orientability property is best understood by looking at a simpler manifold, the Mobius strip. If travel along the Mobius, after one circuit your left and right have switched over, you've become a mirror version of yourself. If the universe is truly one of these non-orientable manifolds, it would have some bizarre consequences for a hypothetical warp ship. Leave Earth and travel in one direction long enough and you return home. Arriving back on Earth you would at first feel the familiarity and relief of being back home, but would quickly realize something was off. Your family's faces were mirror versions of before, their watches ticked anti-clockwise. But from their perspective it would you who was changed and taking you to the doctor for a medical examination, they'd discover your heart was now on the right-hand side. All ten of these manifolds are perfectly consistent with our observations, and all are finite, so any of these could be true but there is another possibility. The universe could be truly infinite, either an infinite flat fundamental domain in all directions, or a negatively curved infinite saddle-shaped universe. Either way, we are forced to face an ontological crisis. 
What if the universe is infinite? Infinities are uncomfortable to physicists because they bring along some disturbing consequences. Given infinite possibilities, everything that can happen must happen an infinite number of times.